Hoborg. Quater wanted to see what would happen if he made a creative being with a big heart. Quater named him Hoborg, meaning big heart. Hoborg was given a crown, and he set out into a void of clouds as Quater watched him from a distance. Hoborg liked the idea of making a place for some beings of his own. He knew that the clouds that swirled around him would make a perfect sky, so he just needed to make some land. One thing that concerned Hoborg was that perhaps some of his beings would come out bad. He wanted to make beings which he could enjoy forever, but he did not want to force them to love and respect him. He decided that he would make his beings with the ability to choose right and wrong. Working everything out in his head, he figured he could make one child at a time and see if he turned out good before he started on the next. Hoborg made a tiny scale model of his world in clay to see if it looked the way he had imagined it. He spent about 20 years designing the shapes and colors of this place which he would call the Overhood. He needed some clay to make his world, and the only place where clay could be found that was of the purity and quality that Hoborg wanted would take 400 years to reach. He was so anxious to get started that he asked for help from Quater. Quater, thank you for making me with such a fine crown. Everything in life is just wonderful. But I was wondering... Hoborg got down on one knee. Can you help me get to the clay of highest quality? Quater laughed. That would take even me a long time to reach. What's wrong with the clay that I have already given you? Hoborg answered, I like the clay you gave me for planning things, but I was hoping for the best ingredients for my beings. You see, I want them to last forever, and clay only lasts for a few thousand years. Quater was impressed. Here is a scope that will help you see as far as you need to. You will be able to pick the shortest path to the clay, which should save you quite a few years of travel. Hoborg received the scope. Oh, thank you, Quater. You are very generous. Hoborg started on his journey that same day. Looking through the scope, he could clearly see the mountain of clay he needed to build the overhood. Every day was the same. Hoborg awoke before sunrise so that he could travel far without heat. But, before he set off to travel each morning, he thought lofty, respectful thoughts about Quater. Hoborg, in his ever-so-deep voice, would sing songs to the ground about how good it was to have been made. After a morning's journey, Hoborg would cover himself up in soil and rest. He resumed his mission in the afternoon and walked toward the Great Mountain of Clay until late in the evening. After twenty years of travel, Hoborg grew very lonely. Soon, he could not stand to go on. He found a chunk of land upon which he could stop and rest. It had one spindly vine growing on it, and Hoborg lay down beside it to enjoy the shade it provided so he might be delivered from his discomfort. And Hoborg was extremely happy about the plant, but at dawn the next day a worm came and attacked the plant and it withered. And it came about when the sun came up that a scorching east wind and the white light of the sun beat down on Hoborg's head so that he became faint and begged to die, saying, Death is better to me than life. Hoborg could not get himself to do anything. He just lay there. Hoborg began to scrape absentmindedly at the dirt where his hand lay. Then he said, Scraping is better to me than death. It was a fine, dry dirt that was packed down and baked hard by the white sun. His fingers bent, lifted, and stretched, bent, lifted, and stretched, bent, lifted, and stretched, scratching relentlessly. His fingers scraped through the layers of fine dust and grit day after day. Just a few grains of dust and grit required weeks of scraping before it broke loose from the ground, the ground that was hard and compacted. More and more dirt added to the pile underneath his palm each month. During the years that had passed, the only sound he heard were the scraping of his hand on the dirt and his breathing. After a pile big enough to pick up formed under his hand, he grabbed it, spat on it, and squeezed it, and squeezed it, and squeezed it, until his hand turned white and his knuckles made popping noises. Hoborg sat up and looked at what lay in his palm as he opened his fist. He saw that he had formed a clot of dirt. Now, the worm that had attacked the spindly vine and caused it to wither popped his head out of the ground and admired the clod, saying, My, what a nice clod of dirt you've got there. Looking Hoborg up and down, it asked, Did you make that all by yourself? Yes, I did, said Hoborg. If I were you, said the worm, I'd stay right there and make more dirt clods. You could fashion them into little beings and populate this chunk of land with them. After all, did you really see a pile of clay through the scout quater gave you? Or did you just want to see it because Quater said you would be able to see it? Hoborg answered, 
Actually, Quater said the scope would enable me to see the shortest path to the clay, and because of that, I should save quite a few years of travel. But I've been traveling for so long. And the worm said to Hoborg, You haven't saved any time in your journey. You haven't ever seen clay, have you? I wonder if Quater has ever seen clay. When Hoborg thought of it that way, he also began to wonder. Was there even such a thing as clay? He had only heard about it. He'd never seen any. Then a thought occurred to Hoborg. Sure, it had taken many years to collect enough dirt to make this one clod, but he had plenty of time, and knew there was plenty of dirt right here. He did not have to keep searching for clay, or he could continue his journey, not even knowing when or if he would reach his goal. He considered making more dirt clods and creating clod beings right there to populate the chunk of land he had stopped on to rest. Sure, it would take a lot of spit, but Hoborg figured he would find a way to work up enough. And now that he had a purpose for scraping, he could use both hands and save time. First, he would finish creating a being from the dirt clod he already had made. Hoborg knelt beside the thing he had put together. The hideous outrage of dirt stretched out, and then, as he worked the clod with his hands, it began to show signs of life and stirred with an uneasy, half-vital motion. Frightful it must have been, for supremely frightful was the effect of his endeavor to mock the stupendous mechanism of his own creator, Quater. His success terrified Hoborg. He cast away his odious handiwork, horror-stricken as far and with as much velocity as he could throw it. He hoped that, left to itself, out wherever it might land, that slight spark of life which had received such imperfect animation would subside into dead matter. Hoborg went to sleep in the belief that the silence of the grave would quench forever the transient existence of the hideous clod which he had looked upon as the cradle of life. He slept, but in a dream he was awakened. He opened his eyes, beheld the horrid thing standing at his side under the spindly vine. In Hoborg's dream it grew back, and it looked on him with yellow, spit-oozing but speculative eyes. Hoborg awoke for real, and was horror-stricken because he saw something far away and it was growing less and less far away with every minute. At first, he thought it was the clod creature coming back to get him, but as it got closer, he could see that it was much bigger than a dirt clod. A short while passed before Hoborg could make out the shape. It was a piece of land with a little red-roofed house on it. There was a big robot and a little being on it. Hoborg realized that these folks would pass him if he did not act quickly, so he took off his belt from around his waist and made a lasso. He figured that it still was not long enough to reach this passing landmass, so in an act of desperation he gouged a chunk of his chest out and rolled it into a great snake that extended the end of his belt. The contraption was long enough to lasso the land, which halted when the cord went taut. The big robot pointed to Hoborg's chest and said, Me Bill. Me Bill. Hoborg waved and answered, Me Hoborg. I am Hoborg. The smaller being, slightly smaller than Hoborg, but one-fiftieth the size of Bill, pointed to Hoborg's chest and said, Me think in pointing your torso. Big ouch. Hoborg had not realized that his guts were oozing out of the large fissure he had created in his chest. Good quater, what am I going to do? The small being took off his own belt and instructed Bill to carry him down to where Hoborg was. The being jumped into Bill's hand, and he walked over to where Hoborg sat, about to pass out. Me willy, the stranger said as he tied his belt over Hoborg's chest, clamping the severed sections together and closing up the self-inflicted injury. Hoborg placed his hand on Willy's shoulder. Hello, Willy. I am Hoborg, and you just saved my life. Willy did not seem to acknowledge this statement. Hoborg figured Willy was not altogether sane, but he was grateful just the same. After a few days of rest, Hoborg decided it was best to continue on his journey. Hoborg asked Bill and Willie if they wanted to join him, but Bill just said, Me, Bill. Me, Bill. And Willie mumbled a bunch of gibberish to himself. Hoborg liked their company, but he figured that they did not want to come along, so he tearfully said goodbye. Hoborg was surprised to find that when he walked, Bill and Willie followed him. Hoborg did not question them, he just grew happy inside and continued toward the clay. Big Robot Bill, Hoborg found out his full name because it was engraved on the back of his foot, proved most useful for carrying Willy and Hoborg in the little red-roofed house over canyons too steep to climb. Hoborg noticed, while being carried by Big Robot Bill, that Bill's chest had a switch inside it marked good at the present setting and bad on the other setting. 
Hoborg dared not find out what the bad setting did, but he thought it must be a poorly thought out attempt at dealing with the same problems he had when he was planning the making of beings that were capable of doing right and wrong. Within a few more years, the three made it to the clay. It was a mountain of the purest clay in the known universe, and Hoborg found it to be of higher quality than he or even Quater imagined it would be. He filled his crown up with a few good-sized hunks of clay. Bill and Willie carried a few hunks to help. Altogether, Hoborg figured there was enough to make his overhood, and about 2,000 beings. On the way back to where Hoborg had started his journey, a tick burger came upon the trio. A tick burger is something all icky and sticky that Quater always said to run away from. Hoborg yelled for Bill to grab Willie and himself and make a run for it. A tick burger is made to want what others have. He could tell that they had a bunch of clay, so he licked his lips, exposed his fangs, and said, Clay! As fast as Bill could run, it was not fast enough to outrun the nimble tick burger. The ID panel on the back of Bill's foot was removed with one swipe of tick burger's razor sharp claw. Hoborg saw that Bill was slowing down and that they would soon perish if they did not do something quick. Hoborg threw all of the spare clay over to the ground below. He figured the amount remaining would still be enough to make a medium-sized world and about 500 beings. The problem was that as soon as Hoborg dumped the clay, Tickburger gobbled it up, and it was still closing in on Bill. Hoborg nervously threw some more clay out, and this time Tickburger ate it but slowed down considerably. This was not good enough, though, since Bill was also slowing down considerably from the exhausting pace. He simply could not carry on much longer. Hoborg decided that he would have to be happy with about 20 beings in a small neighborhood as a world. With that, he dumped most of his clay over, with just a bit left for his greatly reduced plans. It worked this time since Tickburger stopped completely, and could not follow them since he was stuffed with so much clay. Bill continued on under Hoborg's guidance, holding the little red-roofed house on his shoulder where Willie and Hoborg could ride and room together. After many years' journey, Hoborg returned and was ready to build the Everhood. A neighborhood that would last forever. So long as nothing went wrong.